As we travel from 0 to 1, this box here turns black. When we are in two dimensions, we have two boxes to denote the position in this unit square. One box for the x coordinate and one box for the y. In three dimensions, we have three boxes. Similarly, we can use four boxes to denote where we are in a four dimensional unit hypercube. The hypercube is hard to visualize, but we can get a feel of it through these boxes. This is the midpoint, this is a vertex, this is us moving on an edge. We can represent any point in let's say a 14 dimensional unit hypercube using 14 boxes. Here is some advice on how to visualize a 14 dimensional hypercube. What you do is you visualize a three dimensional space and you say 14 to yourself very loudly. Instead of 4 or 14, we now have 256 into 256 boxes. We can think of these boxes as pixels of a grayscale image. It's crazy to think that all kinds of images, screenshots, books, diaries, written in different kinds of scripts are all just points in this hypercube. It doesn't stop there though. If we sample points uniformly at random, we are always going to get noisy images. This tells us that images which make sense to us are extremely rare in the hypercube. Coming back to R2 space, if we move just a bit towards the origin, both these boxes become slightly whiter. Similarly, if we move linearly towards the origin, all the boxes or pixels become slightly whiter. This point is an image of a smiling girl and this point is an image of the same girl but with no smile. If we linearly travel between these two points, the transition is not smooth. That is, the intermediate points do not look like faces. But if we follow a path such that the intermediate points are also faces, the transition from no smile to smile would be smooth. Turns out, this path lies on the face manifold. Every point on or near this manifold is a face. For example, this point here is this face and this point is this face. If you travel between these points while remaining on the face manifold, we would have a smooth transition between the faces. These are some points in R2. We represent where they are using two coordinates, but the underlying structure of the data is one-dimensional. The line near which the points lie can be called as a one-dimensional manifold embedded in a two-dimensional ambient space. We could represent each point using a local coordinate system on the manifold. In other words, this manifold lies in a two-dimensional space, but is homeomorphic with a one-dimensional Euclidean space. To elaborate further, in R2, if we are at this position, we have the freedom to go in any of these directions. But an imaginary ant, which can only traverse on the manifold, sees the world as R1 and has limited degrees of freedom. The only directions in which it can go are front and back. Similarly, all these faces are just points in a high dimensional space. But like the previous example, the dimensionality of the points is artificially high. The data lies on or near a low dimensional manifold embedded in a high dimensional space. These points have these many coordinates, but they can be represented using n coordinates with local coordinate system on the manifold. In this plot, we can observe that there is a correlation between height and weight in humans. We can say that all these points lie on or near a one-dimensional manifold. This is an example of naturally occurring data having few underlying degrees of freedom. Physical bounds prevent us from observing a data point, let's say over here. It is not possible to observe a weight versus height distribution which looks like this. Similarly, there are correlations between pixels of images. Pixels in a region tend to have similar values. Physical laws restrict the degrees of freedom of the actual content of the images. Gravity restricts us from observing a cubic planet or a levitating man. So these images are definitely not on the naturally occurring images manifold. In this high dimensional space, we actually have the freedom to go in any direction. But if we want to traverse only on the face manifold, our degrees of freedom are limited. Moving on the face manifold causes changes in the image. 
if we go off in a direction out of the manifold, we might find some freaky things which don't occur naturally, but mostly we will find just noise. These are some examples of us roaming around different manifolds. This is the clock images manifold. We have two images of a clock. One shows 4 o'clock and the other shows 4.40. If we take the midpoint of the linear path between these images, it would look like this. This image does not lie on the manifold. But the midpoint of a path which lies on the clock manifold would look like this. Which makes more sense than this. By modeling the manifold, the computer can understand the image better. Machine learning algorithms like VAs and GANs learn to approximately model image manifolds using large-scale image collection. These models involve learning a mapping from a low-dimensional latent space to a high-dimensional pixel space. Moving in some direction in the latent space results in moving in some direction on the manifold in the high-dimensional pixel space. We don't explicitly define this mapping, it is learned as an optimization task. Getting more control over the features of the generated images is an area of ongoing research.